University of Plymouth, but I've also been an associate lecturer there. Um, I have a background in uh, secondary education teaching. I was a citizenship educator in the UK. Um, I then uh, became a consultant on eco and education for sustainability work with uh, schools across Plymouth. I then also diversified even further um, and became an outreach um, education officer across the whole of the southwest of England, um, where I worked for the UK Parliament, teaching about um, democracy, um, activism, campaigning, um, and how to hold politicians and governments to account. Um, so a lot of my background and my career is essentially trying to combine um, ecological climate awareness alongside social justice, so eco-justice and social justice. And as part of um, the course uh, that I was undertaking, we were asked to explore um, our utopian ideas around what um, our sort of ideal educational uh, system would look like. And education and society um, and ecosystems are essentially um, uh, symbiotic. And um, I grew up as a very young child in Australia. And I've always had um, a very strong interest um, to uh, Australian Aboriginal belief systems. And I wanted to use that as a model to frame um, what my utopian education system uh, could potentially be and, and look like um, and how we might explore that um, in, in the presentation today. Um, I also take quite a lot of my influences um, around utopian and hope thinking as well uh, from Ruth Levitas and Darren Webb. Um, and uh, I'm going to be looking at uh, three themes that come out of um, Aboriginal belief systems in Australia. Um, that is the dreaming, seeds and song lines. And uh, these are integral to the um, onto epistemological um, belief systems of Australian Aborigines and uh, the metaphysical and material um, way that they um, exist with nature and understand their interconnection and interdependence with nature as well and forms the basis of my argument around potential future utopian visioning of, of how an education system could be created. Um, so the dreaming our world into existence is a story, culture and belief of the Australian Aborigines, where material worlds and metaphysical worlds coexist in the dreaming. And the inherited stories of their culture bring knowledge of tools, maps, law, morals and meaning with the landscape of their lives. The Aboriginal concepts and culturally significant meaning of the dreaming, seeds and song lines will be discussed in connection with the growing concerns that the uncultured dominant worldview needs to be challenged for future, uh, for the future to be ecologically, socially, culturally and economically just for planet Earth. So the immediate future relies on the sustaining of life, Earth's biosphere, and ensuring future generations can not only be ecologically sustainable, but also socially sustainable. Therefore, we need to dream a new way of educating into being. And this visioning process is approached um, from, from my sort of methodology and, and how I wanted to approach it as the expression of the desire for a better way of living or being. And that comes uh, very much from Ruth Levitas's work. And how we can facilitate the process of building social, cultural and ecological destiny. And that's where the influence of Darren Webb comes in as well to my thinking. So the dreaming. Um, so the dreaming is the first part of the, the, the exploration that I did, um, and this is about challenging the um, ontological uh, dominant worldview and uh, looking at uh, the inheritance of colonialism and uh, how we think and why we think the way we're thinking um, and, and how do we challenge that, how do we enable ourselves to think in a different way. And for me, um, the, the main challenge is for future generations to be able to conceive of this world very differently and to interact with one another and interact with our ecosystems in very different ways. We do actually have to challenge the ontological um, thinking processes that we have. 
So the story we have inherited from uh, past philosophical thought and dominant narratives has perpetuated perspectives and cultural beliefs that are now seen as the cause of our current ecological crisis and social inequalities. Within the learning for sustainability and environmental education movements, there is an agreement that the inherited anthropocentric worldview must be challenged and that education systems have a responsibility to provide a redesigned approach to learning, forming knowledge differently and deciding what inherited cultural patterns are necessary to create a more utopian or ecologically mindful future for humans and non-humans on Earth. Therefore, the first and most substantial underlying aspect of dreaming a new way of educating into being is to change the inherited dominant worldview. That's quite, quite a big task. <laughs> and to change this, we can learn from and adopt philosophies and ideas from indigenous beliefs, which is where I orientated my paper around Aboriginal um, indigenous beliefs. And that then enables a plurality of ontologies and uh, the diversity of worldviews, um, not allowing one dominant one to, to take over and dictate um, our social infrastructures and our relationship with the ecosystem. So the average of dreaming or dream time is one influential and persevering worldview that has managed to, uh, to um, alongside many others, that has managed to stay uh, very prominent. And it can teach us about what it means to be human um, and to live uh, in, a, in a commons way um, without ownership, which is the biggest message of their um, ontology and changing the worldview. Um, and that's another exceedingly big task. So the Australian Aborigines consider land as inseparable from themselves and their ontological position as that human beings are intrinsically and eternally interconnected and independent with the land. The Aborigines choose to perceive the world through, uh, through the dreaming as they believe in a non-materialistic and non-linear ontology and that can be dreamt into being requires a deep awareness of our intrinsic interdependent relationship with nature. The dreaming therefore makes us have to consider what being human means and how we choose to cohabit as communities and coexist with the natural world. One approach would be um, how to adopt commons living, okay, which is very much a, a popular um, idea that is uh, coming into a lot of people's consciousness now and, uh, and originates, the, the commons idea originates um, within uh, medieval um, practices and far beyond that. Uh, where we learn that we share the life world upon which all depend and the relationships underpin the success of communities and all well-being. This approach requires no ownership and therefore our entire global economic system alongside our social infrastructures for mass production of goods and purchasing land property uh, would be obsolete, potentially forming a non-authoritarian ecological society. And that title is taken from Coleman and O'Sullivan in their 1990 uh, publication on William Morris's ideas around utopia. So the Aborigines, um, referring to us as white fellas, think it's quite absurd that we own anything. Um, and often regard this as a form of insanity because if we are interdependent with nature and our survival and meaning of life is intrinsic to nature, then no one can own anything. Sorry, my slides seem to be a bit different. Okay. Um, so the next um, part of dreaming a new education into being was thinking about the importance of creating belonging. Um, and a lot of the work that I've um, additionally done alongside uh, this paper is around um, place-based um, education. And um, this is, um, adopts these ideas as well. Um, and I want to refer to something that um, Daniel mentioned yesterday in this room, which was Carl Sagan's um, quote around We Are All Made of Stardust. Um, and this comes into this idea of the Aboriginal uh, belief around the seed. And uh, Danvers also, um, I want to read his quote, um, brings this into um, a, a beautiful uh, phrase as well. That it's almost certainly the case that every atom in my body or yours has passed through many stars and been part of millions of other organisms before becoming me or you and passing on to be part of the countless other entities. And the seed um, to the Aborigines is um, timeless. Um, we are inheriting from our past 
um, creating and manifesting while we exist now and we have to be fully conscious and responsible for what we are then transferring into our future. Um, so this awareness at an atomic level of biological processes links into the next Aboriginal concept and that of the seed, which is perceived physically and materially as well as metaphysically, um, just like the dreaming, um, that we are all seeds, okay, and the information passes between generations and thus carries inherited codes and patterns. And in this context of being human, we then carry culture and beliefs. The cultural codes and patterns for the next generation are therefore inherently important to the survival and success for the future generations and require deliberate care and conscious educational transfer. So for me, one of the biggest ethical responsibilities of any community is its process of educating and how we teach and what we teach. So all the seeds have memories according to the Aborigines and they birth futures. And the Aborigines see a seed as an unborn potential fused with ancestral inheritance. So the seed and the importance of its germination in place, time and space links us to, um, gives us the potential to link that idea to Western pedagogical approaches of teaching. Um, and these I'm focusing very much now around how we create a sense of belonging for children and young people in their communities um, and using place-based um, education as a way to achieve that. Um, and these approaches are infused with ecological imperatives, environmental awareness, and a strong counter-narrative to the anthropocentric worldview. So the ecological and environmental emphasis of belonging and place-based education um, are very much orientated around uh, the concept of biophilia. And Wilson, um, uh, who coined this term, essentially argues that all human beings are genetically... Um, predisposed, predisposed uh, I can't say the word, um, genetically um, affiliated with nature, um, and that we naturally want to associate with natural spaces, with plants, with animals, um, and that we can use that as a core way of approaching a new education um, and how, how we come into being um, as human beings and unique um, beings on this planet. Additionally, David Orr, a um, very fundamental writer around biophilia and um, uh, environmental education and place-based learning, argues that biophilia is a way of thinking of our interdependence with nature, and it has to be included in um, education design for the future, not only to inform how we think, but as a means to rebuild lost integration with nature. Um, and he also additionally argues that it creates less dissonance. Um, so we can overcome these cognitive dissonances, these social dissonances, by actually incorporating the idea of head, heart and hands as a, as a fundamental approach to, to how we teach. So this is a natural process, um, interconnected with the idea of the seed again, um, which means wherever a child is in time and, and place, just like a seed, um, it will be able to germinate and bond to that geography, to that culture and the beliefs of that place. Again, emphasizing how important the transference of learning is. So to counter the influence of learning commodification um, and the anthropocentric agendas, the processing of dreaming anew of educating into being needs to be a deliberate moral and conscious decision to foster a nature-human um, bond, to sustain an openness for unique cultures to form in our seeding of place. With each expression of culture and belonging being respected and treated as significant in the global web of knowledge. So the second part of how a new educational system based on um, these indigenous beliefs could manifest is around this idea of um, ontologies of becoming. And I use the Aboriginal um, songlines to symbolise this. And songlines um, are the, the journeys um, and the storytelling and the narratives um, that uh, interconnect a whole range of different layers of the cultural self-expression of um, Aboriginal um, Australians, um, which include their kind of ideas around law um, as well as commerce. And here I wanted to build in the social element of utopias, not just looking at an educational system. Um, so the ontology of 
um, always being um, in a process as a continuous co-construction of reality, again challenges the dominant worldview and critically questions the current design of education systems. The Aborigines believe we come into being from the dreaming and this process is symbolic of natural cycles and an ecocentric worldview. So the song lines exist timelessly with landscapes and ancient history as a living memory of the natural resources, natural laws and regional trading or community places. Um, and if we link these concepts into um, Western society, uh, we could call them our forms of morality, our form of ethics, justice, um, our liberties. Um, and Western culture obviously no longer associates them with the natural landscape. We have unfortunately lost um, the, the ability to create our stories so interconnectedly with the land. But using this idea, um, song lines can become symbolic of some really interesting uh, diversification of um, uh, different movements that are now occurring with more awareness of our interdependence with, with nature, um, such as, especially specific to the UK, I would, I would add, some of them also, um, that society and education um, has the opportunity to uh, simplify the bureaucracy of democracies, okay, and make them a lot more meaningful, a lot more accessible, where people can participate um, in, in, in meaning making for their communities and societies. Um, living slower paced lives, this idea comes from um, Australia, Tooth and Renshaw, um, that um, capitalism and anthropocentrism makes us think we have to be uh, busy, that we have to always have all of these things and actually that's not creating very much happiness and mental health is getting uh, very deeply impacted by that. Um, and those things can then alleviate imposed hierarchies and uh, oppressive social systems. Um, it would also envision smaller self-sustainable cultural commons, uh, adopting approaches to teaching cultural literacy. Um, that can include eco-literacy, global literacy, media literacy, um, so that we are enabling children and young people to be full, fully conscious of where we come from, how the socially constructed world exists right now, and then to question how we want it in the future. Um, so the potential new ways of being would also um, allow meaningful nature responsive traditions to form um, through our commerce and politics while important resource distribution would be um, in synergy with the natural world again. So the Aborigines and many other indigenous cultures achieve this vision and exist in a way as to leave barely a footprint on the land while upholding the integrity of their laws because they are a living story and I think that's vitally important around their onto epistemology um, is that they know that they are part of a very, very big cycle of existence of, of ecosystem. So I'm just going to jump ahead to the final bit. Um, and I, I love this quote from, from Webb, who is an Australian Aborigine, um, talking about the need for people in the community to be visionaries, to actually hold that uh, future potential, um, which the seed offers, which, are, which the song lines that are created through their culture uh, manifest um, with the land, um, and also how their dreaming exists, how the mythology and the narratives um, enable them to understand that there is more beyond uh, just self and the material world. And I'll finish very quickly with um, where, where I'm kind of um, orientating my conclusion. So I, I'm proposing an ethical foresight for, for our education that can then transform society simultaneously through a more ontological utopian mode. And that comes again from, from Ruth uh, Levitas and her work. Okay, I shall finish there. Thank you very much.